been a while. Sorry about that, guys. I've had a lot on and getting ready for for another retreat. Um, this one in far north Queensland. Um, and just so many projects and program going and all sorts of things, but enough excuses. Here we are with another podcast and this one, I think you're gonna find it really interesting. This is with Philly from the Ending Body Burnout Show. So um, I was on her podcast a couple of months ago before I went to Italy and um, we had a really good chat and I wanted to get her onto my podcast as well. And we're talking on this one about addictive doing patterns and perfectionism and stress and all the health issues that um, stress brings into our lives um, and the connection with gut health and stress, um, the connection with um, histamines and stress. Oh my goodness, it's such an interesting episode. I think you'll find it really, really helpful. So um, as Philly will share her story of learning to let go of those perfectionist ways of doing things and learning to have a bit of chill, um, she found that her health really improved and I was the same. So we have so many things in common as she was, as she was talking, I was like, oh my goodness, me too. <laughs> so hopefully you'll get a lot of it out of this because I did. Um, and before we start, I just want to remind you that we have so many amazing podcasts on the channel that you may have not seen them all. If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll be able to see all the past podcasts on there because there's been two different channels. Um, I started off on the wellness couch back in 2015 and um, eventually after about five years on the wellness couch, I started producing my own podcasts. So they're on two different channels. So there's the Quirky Cooking Chat season one and season two. Um, and if you go onto my YouTube channel, you'll see on the podcast tab, you'll see all the podcasts there. Um, you can also listen via Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and all those things. Um, but there's such a lot of wisdom and knowledge in these podcasts where I've interviewed people from all over the world on so many different topics. Um, professionals as well as parents telling their stories as well as um, individuals telling their stories of healing. Um, I'm sharing a lot of practical um, help just like even in the kitchen, um, cooking stuff as well as he healing food type of um, subjects but also just really um, helpful advice that has really changed my life and my family's life and our health. So have a look through if you haven't yet. Um, and I hope you really enjoy the podcast today. And let me know if there's something that you really, really want me to talk about on the podcast or show because these are video podcasts if you're looking on YouTube. Um, so I would love some ideas of what you would like to hear about or see. And um, yeah, let me know. Help at quirkycooking.com.au is where you will find me. All right. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome, Billy. So lovely to have you on the show. Thank you, Jo. I'm so excited to be here. So awesome. Um, I've been having a look at your website and um, so much on there that I want to ask you about. But I think we should start with your story um, because you've got a really interesting story of, um, it sounds a bit familiar to me, of going hard and burning out. I've done yep. that myself. <laughs> <laughs> so could you sort of start with, um, I guess, what led up to the whole burnout and mm. yeah, just start telling us about your story because I'm going to have a lot of questions as we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. Sometimes I'm always like, where do I start in this timeline? I know. <laughs> um, I might go back to earlier. We yeah, were having a conversation about this just in terms of oh, what was happening in childhood. Um, I was a middle child, so I always felt left out. I had two older sisters, two younger brothers. Um, is sensitive soul so I was quite introverted as well oh my um, God, like twins I know <laughs> I know and so over time uh I started yeah I actually I wouldn't have said that I had anxiety back then but looking back there were definitely tendencies of anxiousness shyness that sort of stuff mm. and then when I uh, was in high school all of, I didn't really try hard, but all of, us, all of a sudden I started getting good grades and enjoying the external validation from teachers and parents. And it's like, oh, wow, you're so smart. You're so creative. 
And I feel like I kind of just grabbed onto that and started developing these addictive doing patterns and high achieving patterns and perfectionism and all of that sort of stuff, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. Me. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it felt good because I wasn't giving it to myself and I didn't know how. And so then that drove a behavioral pattern. Anyway, when I was a teenager, I started developing what's called vassal vagal episodes. So basically I couldn't regulate my blood pressure very well when I was under stress and especially when it was physical stress. So even things like taking a Band-Aid off my skin or getting blood tests, um, my body would faint, fit, and then I would pee myself. Oh. Not fun. <laughs> but this oh, started really happening. Oh, um, oh, good question. I th- think I was about 15 when I first had my first episode like that. Wow. Um, and so it wasn't like, it was pretty regular. It was at least once a month, sometimes every couple of weeks, it was regular enough that my mom was concerned. And so she took me around to, yeah, yeah. Especially the peeing yourself as well in the fitting. Like, I mean, fainting's kind of normal, normal ish, not that normal actually. (laughs) (laughs) But then, yeah, so she was concerned about epilepsy and all that sort of stuff. So I went around, did all the tests with specialists. Um, They couldn't find anything. So at the end of the day, I was just slapped with the diagnosis of you're having uh, vassal vagal episodes, which are harmless. You just need to wiggle your fingers and wiggle your toes when you're feeling stressed. (laughs) which actually helped because it helped me to breathe better. So the whole reason behind that uh, that condition is really that your nervous system just isn't regulating very well. Um, but no one back then talked to me around, well, how are you thinking? How are you feeling? How are you behaving? It's just like, just wiggle your fingers and toes and breathe. And so it helped as a Band-Aid approach. Um, but I also had, like you, Joe, a lot of hormonal issues as well. So I was actually um, diagnosed later on when I was trying to have children with my husband with PCOS so and infertility issues. But before that, I was a late bloomer. I think I got my period when I was 17. Uh, same. <laughs> so really? <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Much. Yeah. And when I did, I would only get my period maybe every three to six months. Um And so it was great when I was a young girl and in my 20s, uh, but not so great when I was trying to fall pregnant because I had a lot of infertility issues. Didn't know anything about natural therapies back then. So went down the GP route. um, I was prescribed Clomid, which helps you to ovulate and fell pregnant, had a miscarriage, and then six months later fell pregnant again. So that was quite a bit of a journey. But even back then, I was still functioning fine. There were things now in hindsight that I'm like, there were obviously some pretty big signals that things weren't quite right in my body. Um, But it wasn't until I had my first baby that things really went downhill. So it was a really quite a traumatic birth. Um, So a three day labor, um, two hours of pushing, baby didn't want to come out, ended up coming out with forceps. But during the whole process, um, I had a lot of bladder damage. And um, I had no sensation to pee. So after Poppy was born, I was in the hospital for about a week because I had a lot of complications and tearing up the bowel. Um, But I just didn't pee for like three days. And the nurses kept coming in. They're like, have you gone to the toilet, dear? And I'm like, no, no. I thought they were talking about, I didn't really know what they were talking about. I think they were talking about poos. And I was just like, no, no. And they were like, oh, that's okay. Can take a few days to go to the toilet. (laughs) And then eventually I just said, oh, I haven't done a wee. And they're like, what? So they put an internal catheter in and I can't even remember. It was litres and litres and litres of urine, like five litres that would have just ballooned my bladder up. Um, And then for about the next four months, I couldn't pee. I had to have an internal catheter in and then start self-catheterizing to try and retrain my bladder to urinate again. Um, But during that time, I was on antibiotics 24-7 to prevent UTIs. Um, But I ended up getting really severely constipated a few times, went back to hospital with UTIs on the IV drip with antibiotics. So wow, pretty intense. So adding all of that on top of already imbalances that were kind of like simmering beneath the surface. And And then my newborn. Yes, with a newborn. And then Poppy was getting all the antibiotics through my breast milk. So she was super colicky. She'd be vomiting all the time. She didn't stop crying unless she was asleep. Even breastfeeding, she'd be like, take a breath, cry. Then like 
attach back again and take a breath, cry. And then it, it was just, it was really, really sad seeing her. But my yes, mental health was not good because I'm just like, what am I doing wrong? I feel like I'm an 80 year old. And so there was a lot of emotional stress as well. And what ended up happening is month by month, my body just started breaking down. Like I started getting different symptoms, um, depression, anxiety, low immunity was a really big one for me. So all of a sudden I was catching every bug every two weeks. I'd get over something, catch something new. So I was just exhausted and depleted. Um, chronic back pain as well, um, which sometimes I couldn't even pick my child out of the cot. Some days I was in bed all day um, just because my body was just so inflamed and so much pain. Um, and then Poppy turned one and have you heard of the book Deep Nutrition? No. No, it's based on um, Western A. Price philosophy mm -hmm. of food and the lady who wrote it wrote a PhD and she was kind of like researching this way of eating. That. Um, it's a really good book but I was given that to me by my sister and I was just like oh my gosh you can heal your your body with food what? <laughs> <laughs> and so it talked about like a lot of the stuff we were just chatting about so like using bone broths and fermented foods and organ meats and um you know it wasn't really taking out foods but it's like let's just eat foods in its purest form so if you can get raw dairy raw dairy and I actually was able to access that which was really nice at the time um so my kitchen just became a lab of fermented foods and <laughs> making yogurts and all the things and this is when I came across you Joe, as well because I got a my Thermomix and I'm like yeah this is so good what else can I make and I think my other sister was like you should check out Joe, get her her cookbook and I'm like oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> So month by month again, as I was healing my body with food, definitely started feeling better. And about a year, year later, I'm like, I'm ready for my second baby. <laughs> and we fell pregnant really easy, which was great because it's like, yay, well, obviously what I'd been doing had been helping with my body. Pregnancy was lovely. I was still traumatized from Poppy's birth. So I actually elected for a C-section, even though I was feeling like so much so so many pangs of guilt and shame that oh I'm like this natural person now but I can't do it naturally so there was still a lot of like that oh, self chatter of imagine would have been yeah <laughs> um and then so I had Elsie that was really nice actually the C-section I recovered pretty quickly but because I felt so good these old tendencies of addictive doing started coming back it's like okay yeah two weeks after Elsie this is great is this what it feels like to have a baby that sleeps and doesn't cry and my body feels pretty good and so I just like dove right into work business I was studying nutritional medicine at the time as well and it just didn't give my body a chance to just be and then all the issues started popping up again with vengeance. All the same issues. This time anxiety was really bad. So to the point that I was having panic attacks when I was putting washing out on the line. And it just told me that I hadn't quite got to the root of what was going on. And so then that's what led me to functional medicine. Um, I started doing my own lab testing, looking at different body systems, gut health, adrenals, brain health detoxification and over time healed myself using that modality wow <laughs> well now we want to know how how <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of people listening i'm sure that struggle with the the overdoing um mm -hmm. like i did and also feeling that constant fatigue maybe whether they've got babies or not just that constant depletion so where do you go when you when you don't know where to begin? Mm. How to start healing that? What's the first steps? Yeah. Look, I I mean if we're, if someone was just coming to me and they said that, I'd probably say just start off with your food. Like I always feel like let's do foundation first and and make sure you're sleeping and make sure you're moving or not moving too much. So I was also an addictive mm -hmm. exerciser, which is part of that like overdoing, <laughs> high achieving, which mm -hmm. wasn't helping my ability to heal. Um but I think for me when I that second time when my health flared up again I was just like I just want answers and I found like I was gravitating to the lab testing that functional medicine provides 
because I was just kind of sick of guessing. I'm just like, I just want, I just want to do like a wee and a poo and a spit sample and have that have data <laughs> to say, okay, this is what's going on. Now we can address it. And I wasn't getting anywhere with GPs or like medical specialists or anything. I think the only thing that showed up on blood tests, there were an imbalance. Like my thyroid was always a bit funny, but they were always just like, oh, it's just borderline. It's so good. It's just part of being a a (laughs) mum. I'm like, not everyone has borderline thyroid issues. Um, And so when I did my testing, so I actually worked with, so I had graduated as a clinical nutritionist by then. So I was starting to practice like and helping others, even though there was a part of me that was just like, I need to get myself right first. (laughs) That's life though, isn't it? (laughs) That is, yeah. (laughs) Um, And so then I started a mentorship with Dr. Daniel Kalish. So he's a functional medicine doctor in America and he pretty much just took me by the hand. We started off doing all my own lab testing first and then he later mentored me to help other people too. So do you want me to chat about like lab tests and stuff or Um, what was showing up? I think I would, yeah, what what did you find out and how did you go from, because a lot of people find that they get all these tests but then it just confuses them more because one will say don't eat this and one will say don't eat that and they end up with this tiny amount mm. of food they can eat and they're just so confused. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, actually I didn't do any food allergy testing first um, because I'm like I want to make sure that my body's functioning the best it can and if, and if I still have lingering issues, that I think, because I had a lot of food reaction type issues as well, then I'd do a food test later. So um, so I believe that like a healthy body should be able to eat all healthy foods. Yes. So what I find too when people are doing food allergy tests and that's the first test they do, it is, it gets really confusing. People start developing food fear. Mm-hmm. The better way to go is like, well, let's just address the gut health first and other body systems that are affecting the way that your gut is functioning Mm. and then highly likely you'll be able to eat all the foods because it's just it's really demoralizing when you do food allergy testing it's like I can't eat broccoli I can't eat cashews I can't eat eggs it's like what what can I eat (laughs) yeah I get a lot of messages from people saying my daughter just did food allergy tests and now she can't eat this is what are we gonna eat yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm working on that (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So when I did my testing, so I started just because I knew that I was just in such a hyper dysregulated state with my nervous system. I started looking at like the brain and the adrenals first and I showed up with adrenal fatigue and my dopamine neurotransmitter was really depleted, which also was showing up as a little bit of OCD tendencies. Um, I had this, <laughs> I have shared this publicly, my husband doesn't mind, but I had this weird tendency where I had to check every message, every email, not that I was suspicious about anything that was going on. It was just like this weird, Control almost thing. like I couldn't <laughs> stop it. And even as I was doing it, I'm like, this is a waste of time. This is weird. Mm. But it was like when you have really low dopamine levels, it can like a major sign if I'm sitting with a new client and they're like, you know, showing up with these tendencies is you probably got really low dopamine levels. I think, yeah, I think that's something that you see a lot now. Like, and I've had times where I've been like that myself where without even realizing it, you go and click on the Instagram app, for instance, and start scrolling. And then you're like, what am I doing? And you close it and you walk away and then you come back and you click on the Instagram app and you start, what am I doing? Yeah, I've had times where I've done that. So so if your dopamine lo- levels are low, how did you get there? Mm. Yeah, well, dopamine, so... So the beautiful expression of like having healthy dopamine is having joy and creativity and mental clarity and also energy. But dopamine will burn out when you've been burning yourself out. (laughs) So that's often the main reason why that happens from a behavioral point of view. So you're doing all the things, you're people pleasing, you're perfectionist, Mm -hmm. um, you're juggling all the things. And at some point you're going to be using dopamine way too much or you might even be just, it might not, you might not have addictive tendencies because low dopamine is low. Sorry, dopamine is low. But the behavioural patterns could then deplete dopamine. So every time you're like going to your notifications and I don't know, I'm trying to think, oh, like for me it was exercise too. Like exercise, great, great for mental health. But if you're overdoing it, it's just drawing and burning up those neurotransmitters that are being produced during 
kind of like an addiction, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so how did you work to to fix that? Yeah, yeah. So, so I did a lot of maybe I'll talk about the the other body systems okay. because then I kind of like it was sort of like a holistic approach. It oh, kind of wasn't <laughs> like did this and then this and then this. So my gut we showed up a lot of stuff. So I had Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacterial infection that's super inflammatory. Oh yeah, another symptom that I also had as a teenager that just got worse and worse and worse was like this excruciating heartburn to the point that it was almost like everything that I was eating straight after eating, I'd have really painful heartburn. Um, I worked out later that it was also histamine response okay. as well. <laughs> so histamine intolerance. Um, so I had Helicobacter pylori, parasites, candida, my microbiome, so the good bacteria really depleted. And also I wasn't detoxifying properly. I didn't show up with any kind of genetic issues, but I also grew up um, right next door to our flower farm. So although that sounds lovely. We were <laughs> flower farm too. I know. It was my father's flower farm though. Oh. And so that's so interesting, isn't it? Because it's like, oh, we live out in the country. We're so healthy. The air is so fresh. But farming, we know, unless it's a nice organic farm, has so many toxins and pesticides. So although I grew up on a farm having like fresh veggies and the eggs from the chicken also just overexposed to so many toxins. So it might've just been like an overexposure of toxins for me that just burnt out the detox pathways to the point where I wasn't able to clear toxins very effectively. Mm. Um, so I went through a journey. I definitely, I saw all these physical markers and I'm like, okay, this must be a physical thing. So my initial approach of healing my body was physical. So I did use quite a lot of supplements, like targeted supplements to help restore and rebuild and kill off all the different things showing up in the lab tests. And I developed, I would actually say I developed an unhealthy um, eating, an unhealthy, healthy eating disorder. Yeah. Because I got into this frame of mind and it was this old pattern of like, got to do everything perfect was that I can't have anything like sugar, gluten. So I kind of went to the point where I was super restrictive, but it wasn't from a loving place. It was almost kind of like, I have to do this, otherwise I won't get better. Mm. And I have to do it perfectly, otherwise it's not going to work. All or nothing. <laughs> All or nothing. And so... Yeah, I don't know. I did like anti-candida diets, low histamine diets. So I did a lot of like elimination type diets. Mm. Um, and like they definitely all helped. They all shifted the physiology. Um, most of my symptoms disappeared. I had a few that were kind of still lingering. And so for a good five years, I felt really good and I was functioning well and I was helping other people until COVID came along. So COVID 2020, <laughs> which was only three years ago. Um, all the flaming health issues flared up again. So was, was that like, stress related? Yeah, it was. So we also at the time had it. So my husband had a gym. Yeah. And so again, going back to childhood stuff, I always had like these weird money mindset fears around like finances and scarcity and all that sort of stuff. So when COVID happened, I think my nervous system just like took back all of that stuff that mm -hmm. happened when I was 14 years old and we almost went bankrupt and we had to sell everything. And so going from a kid who thought that we were rich, so we lived in this beautiful farm, really big house. We went on overseas holidays to like all of a sudden everything was gone mm. and I feel like I feel like that just tr triggered some unconscious thing that hadn't ever been processed properly mm. and so I became an insomniac <laughs> I started not sleeping the heartburn came back with a vengeance the anxiety um immune system was okay because we weren't <laughs> going out anywhere. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, okay, I was frustrated, but I'm like, I've done this before. Let's run all the lab tests again. Crazy thing was most of the lab tests were totally fine. Sure. And I was just like, I don't believe this. I'm going to do <laughs> all the same protocols again. So I did all the supplements, all the diets and nothing shifted mm. the symptoms this time. And so then I'm like, there's a deeper root cause to all of this that I just haven't looked at. And that's when I started looking more at like the metaphysical, metaphysical inflammation stresses. So I was so focused on food and toxins and 
taking the right supplements and all that sort of stuff and getting good sleep, but I wasn't addressing any of the behavioral thought belief patterns that were just causing my nervous system to be dysregulated 24 seven. And so when I did all of that, then everything calmed down again. (laughs) Amazing. So the, when, what kind of things did you do to calm down the stress? What sort of practical tips have you got for people? Yeah, so I, because I should say, like, even when I was doing all the physical stuff, I was definitely looking at work-life balance. I'm like, I've got to stop running around like a rooster without her head on. So (laughs) I stopped doing certain things, but I still wasn't addressing why I felt like I had to do the things in the first place. So even though, you know, I would would try and schedule in self-care, I'd go for a walk along the beach or I'd spend time with the kids, I always felt stressed. Like, I always felt like there was something chasing me, like that Mm. dysregulation. And so I knew just looking at work-life balance or, you know, adding in yoga or breath work wasn't addressing the root root cause issue. So I ended up um, working with a life coach. Um, His business is specific around helping people solve their insecurities and that's what helped. Mm. And it was a really cool journey um, uncovering unconscious beliefs and patterns. And I remember about four and a half months into doing like really deep inner work, I was still struggling with histamine issues and heartburn. Um, and oh, I don't know, it's a big long story about how I kind of addressed that, but basically it was just like believing that I am enough, that I'm strong, I'm capable, that it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about me and letting go of all of those fears that, one day um, I ate a food that was quite high histamine so it was kind of like a legume-based pasta with tomatoes and yeah. um, I'd been eating it several days before and having like histamine reactions to it. But by then I was just sick of doing um, elimination diets. I'm like, I don't, I just want to eat food. I believe that a healthy body should be able to eat all healthy food. So I was just eating liberally. Um, but that one night after doing some reflective work and having some like pretty big break breakthroughs in terms of my patterns, I remember I ate the food and nothing happened. Wow. Like my body just wow. digested it. It was just like <laughs> this crazy feeling of light and love and energy from the top of my gut to the bottom. It was beautiful. And then like from then on, it was like my histamine intolerance is gone. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you feel like um, stress can really be playing a huge part in things like histamine intolerance and gut issues. Yes. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Because, well, even like from a physical point, well, the physical reason is that when you're stressed, whatever that trigger is, your adrenals, when you're secreting too much cortisol or if you're in adrenal fatigue, you actually secrete more histamine. So it's kind of like the bucket load gets too high. And if you're in adrenal fatigue and your nervous system is dysregulated, then your gut switches off. So you can't digest food properly. And then then over time, that will lead to chunky particles of food that shouldn't be there and pathogens will overgrow it. And then things like candida and certain types of bacteria produce a lot of histamine. And so, so there's always like a physical reason behind why you have physical symptoms. But for me, and I find for a lot of the people that we work with, the the busy burnt out people is that there's a deeper metaphysical reason that's then triggering a physiological response. Yeah, amazing. If you're really um, sleep deprived, Mm -hmm. do you find that affects histamine levels as well? Asking for a friend? Ask <laughs> I've had times where I've just had not enough sleep, way too busy, and my histamine reactions are so much worse when I'm like that. Yeah. So that's a thing. Yeah, and I reckon it would be because it's just it's playing havoc with your cortisol. Yeah. And so and so like your melatonin should be nice and high and secreting during the night. But if you're not sleeping for whatever reason, it might be because melatonin is too low. Yeah. Or if like sometimes people might be staying up too late doing stuff or they're overthinking and they can't fall asleep. Well, then cortisol has to be high. Like it has to be in excess in comparison to melatonin. Unless you're in adrenal fatigue where things just are not like functioning at all. Yeah. <laughs> um 
then yeah, and it's like your body repairs and recovers when you're asleep. So then if you're you've gone a night where you haven't slept very well, then your body's just under stress. It's under stress that day when it's trying to function. Yeah. So what what do you suggest um, if people are in that really crazy busy? It's like a hamster on a wheel kind of thing, isn't it? You just mm. you feel like you can't get to bed early enough because you've got to get this stuff done and maybe it's working from home. Like that's usually my problem. If I stay up too late on the computer, I cannot sleep for ages. So I have to make, and this is something I've learned um, over the years is you just have to say, well, you know what? My time at night working on the computer is probably not very productive anyway. I'll be better off just going to switching it off, going and doing something relaxing. And then the next morning, start again (laughs) but I've had to really learn that because for years my mindset was well when the kids are in bed then I can do my things and Mm. so I hear this from a lot of young mums as well that um they stay up till midnight because that's the only time they have for themselves Mm. like is there an answer for people that are super busy or have little kids not getting enough sleep feeling burnt out how can they turn that around? What's mm. the tips that you have <laughs> from your experience? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, um, so to, do you know Tony Robbins, Anthony Robbins? Yeah, yeah. yeah he's pretty famous. <laughs> he has a really cool um, quote though and he says, the quality of your life is dictated by the quality of the questions you ask yourself. Mm. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So, so the scenario you just painted, like my first question would be, why do you feel like you have to stay up and either like do the things or have self care? Mm-hmm. It's like, what's happening? What's ha- what's happening from a practical point of view during the daytime that you feel like you can't or have to stay up late to to get whatever you want to get done? Yeah. Um, and it's different for different seasons too. So I totally, like my kids are older now, so I've got a seven and a 10 year old, um, which is nice. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and so my season is different now. However, it would still, it, it would have still been the same sort of questions. So if someone has older kids and it's not that you're trying to stay up because, oh, finally I have time for myself, <laughs> then then the question would be, why do you feel like you have to keep ticking things off? Like why can, why can what you've just done today be enough? Mm. And then... And then the deeper question would be, and how does it make you feel about yourself when you don't get the stuff ticked off? And that's that's the real root cause. <laughs> yeah, that's really good, asking yourself those questions. Yeah. And it does change. Like I've had times where the answer would be um, it's more of a people-pleasing thing. I've promised that I'm going to get this thing done and so I'm going to kill myself to get this thing done. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and I've learnt... I've learned my lesson there, I think, usually, touch wood. (laughs) Um, And I try to teach my children, you know, there's only so much you can do. Mm -hmm. For one thing, um, you know, don't make promises you can't keep, obviously. But also if you have said, I'm going to get this done, but it's detrimental to your health, then you may have to say, look, I'm really sorry, Mm -hmm. but it didn't work out as planned. (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah. And I've had to backpedal a lot of times on things that I've said I was definitely going to do because I'm like oh my health is suffering so no I'm not going to do that yes um but yeah it's it's hard when you just want to please people and you want to help everybody and do all the things um and you you're a mum with kids that you want to make sure their life is happy and they've got all the food and the everything's ready for the day and yeah that's probably where I'm coming from have come from in the past yeah yeah we actually have a podcast this week on people pleasing <laughs> yeah well and- that'll be a good one to listen to <laughs> a friend of mine was talking about it with me yesterday I think you had a um, little meme or whatever up on your 
Instagram about it and that set off our conversation. So. Oh, the 10 characteristics. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, it's like, oh. Every single one of those. And I said, I used to, but I'm so much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like the the root, the root root of people pleasing, like while it sounds Okay, most people who people please or have that tendency or have had it in the past often have really big hearts, which is beautiful. Like you don't want to change that. No. But it becomes unhealthy when you're when you're detrimenting your own self. Yeah, and your family. To then help others. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's that's such a trap because you just want to help others so much that you your own family suffers and you suffer. Yes. Yes. Actually, that was a big one for me too, that I'm just like, I'm saying yes to like all this stuff and my kids aren't getting any part of me. This isn't helping. Yeah. <laughs> um, but often like the the deeper root of people pleasing, which does lead into like that, that busyness and overdoing is because you, you're not valid, you're unable or haven't learned yet how to validate your own self. So it's almost like every time you help someone else, you get that nice feedback loop of, oh, you're such a good person, Joe, or whoever it is, <laughs> Philippa, you're such yes. a good person. You're such a good person. You're so lovely. And then it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's almost, it's actually really hard unless someone's done work around it. Yeah. So if I, if we have a client and they've got really strong people pleasing patterns and they're brand new, they haven't really done too much work around that yet. It would be the worst thing for me to say to them, just stop saying yes to people. Just stop helping people because the moment <laughs> that you stop that behavior, you have nothing to validate yourself anymore. And that feels awful. And that's where people often like develop depression or maybe other health issues because they're like, I don't even know who I am. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like that's what I went through when I was probably, and uh, we were talking about that on the podcast, on your podcast with the early you know, with your little kids and you're constantly giving, giving, giving to them and to other people and then you do, you totally lose yourself. Mm. Yeah. So I think I, I've heard a lot of mums say that. Yeah. yeah and then it's so almost like this vicious cycle too. It's like, ah, and then the adrenals burn out even more and the neurotransmitters burn out and, oh, the lovely serotonin that helps us to sleep and helps us stay nice and stable throughout the day. Well, that's burnt out too. And now your gut's not functioning very well. And now you can't detox properly. And then it causes the tendencies to happen even more because you're feeling so yucky. Wow. So continuing on with your story, where did you go from there once you started to work on the, the metaphysical things? What was next? Did you sort of were you already working on all the gut health stuff? I yeah, you? I was. So I'd done like all the physical stuff just like from a timeline. When did I start that? Maybe back in 2017. Well, no, I started all the food stuff way earlier than that. Mm -hmm. Then when I did the functional medicine testing and the supplements and the healing diets, um, that was probably like an 18-month journey really to okay. really like physically heal all of that stuff. Um and then the the metaphysical stuff came later because yeah. I realized that, oh, like my body actually is healed. Like my physiology is not burnt out like it used to be, but I'm still getting these physical sensations. And a lot of that work too was some people might have heard about things like nervous system regulation training or brain rewiring or brain retraining. Yeah. And so that was a big part of my journey as well mm -hmm. in that I just created all these neural pathways for many, many years, even decades going right back to when I was a little girl that when I get triggered by something, this is what happens. And so I really had to work purposefully wholeheartedly on just creating like feelings of safety in my body and feeling safe in being me was mm. like the crux of it really mm. um and like I continue those practices daily so it's almost like everything that I've done in the past I've now just integrated just like in a nice flowy way that's not forced or not um You'll probably know like when you guys did GAPS, there is that that period where it is more uh, time consuming, I guess. Like it yeah, is kind of like it is. It's part of like it's a huge part of your everyday life. And then when you have then healed, you still carry on some of those practices, but they just become 
part of you and your lifestyle. So that's kind of like where I'm at now. <laughs> <laughs> so what can I ask what a morning looks like for you? How do you start your day? Yeah, awesome. So this is also something that I've worked on letting go of perfectionist patterns. <laughs> <laughs> because my morning not routine an hour run in the mornings <laughs> <laughs> no oh my gosh yeah I used to get up at like 5 a.m to do boot camp classes I'm like no thank you <laughs> I've never had that tendency I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> um so so when so my morning looks a bit different depending on what I've got going on I love sleep so I just I just like to wake up naturally which for me this might sound really no, I'm not even going to use the word lazy. This would have been the old way of like, I'm so embarrassed that sometimes I, yeah. I just sleep until <laughs> 7 or 7.30, sometimes even <laughs> 7.45. <laughs> but now I'm like, I just relish in that now. It's just the best. Occasionally I'll have to wake up a bit earlier if I have a, yeah. an, you know, an early consult or a podcast or something like that. Yeah. Um, but on those, those nice mornings, which are more often than not, um, I do a really nice morning ritual. So I just stay in bed um, and I usually pop some tunes on from Spotify. Yeah. And I've created a movie soundtrack <laughs> of motivational movie soundtracks that just like get me into state straight away. So the moment that I hear this music, I get emotional. Like I'm just like, this takes me back to when I was doing the really deep work to try and create new beliefs about myself and rewire my brain. So that music is just kind of like a, an anchor, I guess, that puts me back into that state. Music is powerful. <laughs> it's so powerful. And then I'll do some self-talk affirmations around like who I want to be. So for a long time, I have really been working on like a core wound core inner wound of mine or an old belief was that I was inherently weak and incapable I created that when I was a little kid can kind of like piece back to when I did that mm. um and so it took time to create new neural pathways that I am strong and capable and I am enough and so I kind of like use that in my self-talk and affirmations and kind of go through different areas of my life that I want to see results in or like better results so motherhood marriage business health body all that sort of stuff um and then I usually do some visualization as well so I'm like five years from now where do I want to be what do I want it to look like because there's so much research that shows that when you visualize something your body produces the same sort of chemical reactions to when you actually experience it in real life yeah um, which is amazing. And so then when you see something in your mind, then it's more possible that it's actually going to happen in yes. reality. So that's kind of like my little morning ritual. Sometimes I'll add some like readings or little my, like one minute star jumps or something just to like energize <laughs> myself. <laughs> And then it's getting the kids ready for school and having breakfast and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And do you find that, um, do you, do you do a sort of regular breakfast or what's your, what's your thing with breakfast? What kind of foods do you eat for breakfast? I always yeah. find it interesting because it's such a wide variety of ideas on breakfast. Yeah. I have my old trustees. I've gone through phases where I'm like, eggs, um, frittata, smoothies, but I seem to, my body just really likes warm foods for breakfast. Yeah, same. So like I'll make like a nice, like this morning I had just a really nice porridge with yeah. chia seeds and some nuts and some almond milk. Um, or sometimes I buy um, primal alternative bread is amazing. So Which Helen's. Um, oh, all of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love oh, all I of love, them. I love the kind of alternative stuff. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so like even just a piece of that mm. with some natural almond butter or sometimes like natural mm. peanut butter, like that is, that does me until lunchtime and it's just like nice and easy and warming and I love it. It's not a um, hard thing to do in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. And mm. then I might make a turmeric latte on the side. So I don't know, my breakfast probably isn't that exciting, but I it works for me and my people, body. People like to hear, um, like I often get people message me and say, can you just post photos of everything you eat in a day? And I'm like, pressure. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes it's so like leftovers and boring stuff and 
you know, it's not exciting. You th- people think because you write recipes, you must eat amazing food all day. I'm sorry, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I quite often have leftover sweet potato fried in a bit of ghee for breakfast with a spoonful of sauerkraut or um that sounds I'll amazing that for lunch <laughs> as well <laughs> yes yes I'm a I'm a uh, what would I we call people like are you a salamander or a cat when it comes to eating so salamanders like to have like they're happy having the same foods right over and over again yeah. whereas cats like more variety and so it's kind of good to identify because if a cat's trying to eat like a salamander they're probably not going to have a su- sustainable way of eating for a long time Yes. So I am definitely a salamander. So I'm like leftovers. I love leftovers. <laughs> I had leftovers for breakfast. Nice. Had, um, what did I have? Oh, I had fish and vegetables for breakfast with sauerkraut. Oh, that's good. Oh. Nice. Um, and coffee with cream. <laughs> what about give us an idea of a regular sort of um, dinner for you? Mm. Like that you feel like is really helpful for all the adrenals and the yeah um some good ideas for our listeners yeah it will usually mostly consist of some sort of meat or veggie so and I keep it again I keep it really simple um sometimes people look at me or talk to me and like oh you're a you're a clinical nutritionist you must love cooking (laughs) I like I do like cooking but I also don't like cleaning up (laughs) And so when I when I cook meals, I'll usually cook it so there's enough for like dinner and lunch for Same. a day or two, and then eight, I don't have to do so liters. much. <laughs> yes, so big. Um, so in answer to your question, that was a bit of a segue. Um, yeah, like really simple stuff. Like my favorite would be a roast, a nice oh, roast same. with lots of like lovely roast veggies yep. and getting creative too. Like not just like potato, but let's chuck in some turnips and some purple carrots. And um, the other day I did, oh, the other day I did Brussels sprouts in the roast and mm. I wanted to drizzle like a really small amount of pure maple syrup on it, Ooh. but it came out way too fast. <laughs> The kids loved them, but it's just like, <laughs> this is like dessert for dinner. So that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> but I do, I don't know. My kids have gone through phases. So I remember when they were really little, I was super. And this is probably when I was kind of like bordering on unhealthy, healthy eating yeah. where I'm like, you are never tasting sugar ever. So I would make like, say a custard in the Thermomix without any natural sweetener at all and chuck oh. in cacao. What? <laughs> I know, right? How yucky is it? And they would eat it because they'd never had anything else. They'd be like, oh, yeah, this is good. And I remember I had um, some nieces come over. They were maybe 10 at the time. I'm like, here you go, have some custard. And they were like, this is disgusting. (laughs) (laughs) So I've become a bit more creative with getting my kids to eat foods. (laughs) A bit more flexible. A bit more flexible as well, yeah, especially now that they're older and they do go to places where you know there's just like I'm definitely not a helicopter parent so I'm just like you you guys can choose what you eat that is okay let's just like meth listen to the messages from your body afterwards and you can decide whether you choose to eat that again usually they still do but then I found it a little bit more difficult with them now being older and having like a wider taste buds is that sometimes the stuff that they used to love they're like this is disgusting mom (laughs) And so then it's like, how can we make this a bit more palatable for you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, before we finish up, I would love for you to talk about your little mini course that um, can really help people who are trying to recover from burnout. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So that's our um, Conquering Hormonal and Gut Burnout. So we created, it's a free course. It's got 10 different um, like mini videos, especially too for people who are busy. They don't have a lot of time. So they're nice little just bite-sized, punchy um, videos in a 10-part mini course. And we go over, well, a lot of the stuff that we do in our functional medicine practice and the things that we test for. So why may you be having gut issues or hormonal symptoms showing up or energy issues or mood issues? Um, And that course educates people in terms of like what is adrenal fatigue and how can leaky gut actually affect the way that you're thinking and feeling and your energy levels um so yeah if you wanted to put the link in the show notes yeah, um, 
it's a it's a nice little course that really dips into functional medicine and also a holistic way of of healing yeah I meant I did mean to ask you earlier but I got sidetracked um because you do talk about hormone issues and and energy levels related to that so for those of you who want to know more about that that's probably a good place to start yeah that is a good place to start we also have and it might even be linked in the the mini course but there's also we've created a ending body burnout assessment which is a quiz that people can take as well which might be helpful as well Mm. um just for people to kind of gauge where are they at from a body burnout point of view and then the quiz also breaks it up into potential root causes so it's like a big part of why you're feeling burnt out coming from the body and the behaviors that you have that support your body or is it more the mind or is it more like environmental factors or maybe it's all three <laughs> yeah well, it's a bit of a combination it's isn't often it? a combination yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh that's really helpful well I'll put those in the show notes and guys just have a look through that because um yeah if you're sort of on borderline heading towards burnout and adrenal fatigue, that should help you to pull back, should it? Give you an idea that you're heading that way? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And it's it's graded as well. So it's like if, if you're in the green, it's like you're doing really good and you're doing all the things to support your health. And then if it's kind of like orange or yellow and then if you're down at red, then that's a warning flag. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah. the to end, I would love if you could just share one little takeaway that people could begin to work on to reduce their chance of burnout. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sleep. You chatted about sleep last time <laughs> on my podcast. <laughs> I also think, okay, reducing the chance. Yeah, no, reducing the chance of burnout. I would say like sleep is so huge. And I find that again, as we were talking about like the patterns that can cause people to not sleep, whether that's because they're trying to do the things to, and then not going to bed or they go to bed, but they're worrying about all the things, mm. then prioritize sleep hygiene and going to bed. But I always, I always, I think like the the biggest help would just be learn to listen to the messages from your body Mm. is like, because you have all the wisdom inside of you already. Like, yes, it's awesome to listen to us and experts and podcasts and, and have a guide to help you through the journey. But at the end of the day, you have everything inside of you already Mm. because the symptoms that we have are purely just survival messages. They're kind of like, um, something inside is not right, whether that's a physical thing or a metaphysical thing, your body will send you these pain messages to grab your attention. Yeah. And when you can actually listen to them and yet, yes, it takes time and practice to kind of like learn to actually understand why that is there, but you can do that. You can start practicing that just by like having some time alone, lying down on the bed, going out in nature and just like feel into what are you trying to tell me body like what are you trying to tell me oh and then sometimes it's just like whatever pops up in your head is highly likely what you need to know and might be like yeah maybe I need to work on my nutrition or ah yeah okay I really need to work on the beliefs I have about myself or whatever it is and then when you act on them the symptoms will disappear if that's the message that was trying to get your attention Oh, that's such good advice. Thank you so much. Um, I think that a lot of people will find this podcast really helpful. So thank you. Thank you. Um, But yes, guys, please make sure you go and check out chrisandphilly.fm. Is that your, that's your, is that right? That's your website? Yes, that's it. Yep. Yep. chrisandphilly.fm and the links are below. Heaps of info there. And you've got a podcast called Ending Ending Body Body Burnout. Burnout. Yep. Thanks so much. Thanks, Joe. It's been so lovely to chat. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. Bye.